Okay, so uh, we're here today at the 86th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Biological Timekeeping, which was held virtually this year. So you can see I'm joining you from my living room. Um, so my name is Luke Smith and I'm an associate editor at PLOS Biology. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Benjamin Tu. So thank you for joining us. Sure. Um, so Dr. Tu is in the Department of Biochemistry at the UT, at UT Southwestern, where his lab studies oscillations in yeast and yeast metabolic cycles. Um, work, and this work has revealed important insights into how metabolism, epigenetics, and gene expression are linked. And so today I'd love to hear about some of your work on this topic. Um, and, but first I thought it might be helpful um, to just ask you to give us a broad overview of what types of oscillatory behavior you study in yeast and what tools you use to, to kind of measure these cycles. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. If you look in the literature uh, dating back to the 60s, uh, you know, budding E cells have been reported to exhibit various types of oscillatory behavior. Uh, either in, in cell extracts or in intact cells. And one of the most popular and easiest ways to observe oscillatory behavior is in terms of their oxygen consumption. And so typically you can see this when you grow E cells in a fermenter or a, or a bioreactor, or sometimes we call them a chemostat, where you can basically uh, grow E cells to very high density and with a dissolved oxygen probe, you can kind of monitor rates of oxygen consumption. And uh, various uh, groups all over the world, as well as in the fermentation industry, have noted that uh, you know, budding yeast cell populations can, can exhibit these very robust oscillations in terms of their oxygen consumption. So they go through phases where they consume uh, oxygen quite rapidly, and then phases where they consume oxygen much more slowly. And is that related just to cell cycle behavior? Like, are they in synchronized cell cycle or, or is this just within the media they, they'll naturally undergo these types of metabolic cycles? Yeah, yeah, so it's a, that's a good question. So uh, with these fermenters or chemostats, we can kind of control the rate uh, of cell growth. So we can basically kind of feed these dense cell populations with nutrients at a very, uh, slow and controlled rate. And so we can really kind of slow down uh, their growth rate. And typically, uh, at least in the experiments we've done, uh, under conditions where these yeast cells uh, easily oscillate, only a fraction of cells uh, will uh, undergo and enter the cell division cycle. And what's neat is that if a cell is gonna divide, they usually divide within a very specific window. But yet the whole, uh, culture maintains an overall synchrony, at least in terms of dissolved oxygen consumption. Um, yeah, and I would also be interested to hear about kind of your personal background and how did you become interested in studying these oscillatory phenotypes? And, uh, you know, what were the questions that were interesting to you when you were starting out in this field? Yeah, so I, I uh, became interested in, uh, I guess, biological cycles uh, during my postdoc. I was uh, you know, very interested in sort of links between circadian rhythm and, and metabolism. And it seems like there's just, you know, more and more connections uh, that people are reporting, uh, uh, especially in, in recent years. And, uh, you know, I, I think at the time, uh, you know, clock and period, you know, these are past domain containing proteins that, uh, you know, basically control circadian rhythm. And, uh, these past domains had been shown in more simple species to sort of bind and sense uh, small metabolites, for example. So I was very intrigued with the uh, idea that perhaps clock per might, you know, bind or sense some, something about metabolism. Uh, and this would be a way for uh, circadian rhythm to be linked to metabolism. And so uh, but then, you know, we came across uh, some of this literature on yeast oscillations and realized that, you know, yeast uh, also have a number of past domain containing transcription factors, but then at the time their functions were totally uh, not known at all. And so uh, this was a way we thought uh, that we could potentially learn something about how, uh, I guess, you know, maybe not necessarily direct orthologs, but how 
uh, a past domain containing transcription factor could regulate some sort of biological oscillation. Yeah. So, do they, so the question was, do they have a similar clock mechanism, like a orthologous yeah, clock? Yeah, or maybe a common conserved metabolic component underlying, uh, for example, yeast oscillations and, and circadian oscillations. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so I mentioned, I alluded to this at the beginning. So, so your work eventually led to a connection to defining a connection between metabolism and epigenetics and these yeast. And I, I wonder um, if you could just, just kind of describe some of your findings about how meta like metabolic cycles link to epigenetic regulation of oscillatory behavior in the yeast. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a really so, interesting aspect of your talk. I really enjoyed that part of your talk. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, sure. So actually, I, I, um, I can recall participating, I think, in the, the, the past uh, uh, symposium on, on biological oscillations and rhythms. And I think this was in 2007. And around that time, we had just, you know, finished performing sort of a uh, uh, kind of microarray analyses uh, at the time of gene expression to ask, you know, are any genes uh, fluctuating uh, in terms of their mRNA levels uh, as a function of these oscillations and oxygen consumption? And, you know, we saw over half of these genes, uh, you know, being periodically expressed. And, you know, these genes sort of nicely segregated into sort of three major superclusters. And so we were just fascinated by you know, how does the cell turn on each uh, set of genes, and there's often over a thousand genes in each of these uh, phases. And how can the cell specify these gene expression programs with such remarkable precision and periodicity, right? And and we really, at the time, had no idea how this might uh, work. Uh, but then, you know, seeing these oscillations in oxygen consumption made us uh, hypothesize that there's got to be changes in metabolism and metabolic state, right? So you see these cells going through robust phases of oxygen consumption and then phases where they don't consume oxygen. So you think metabolism has to be dynamic as well. And so back around, you know, uh, 2007 or so, uh, you know, we are using uh, mass spec uh, technology to try to develop methods to quantitate the abundance of uh, a, a panel of very common metabolites you would find in cells. And so at the time, you know, metabolite profiling wasn't really in fashion yet, uh, but then uh, became a very powerful tool because we could actually measure these, uh, these small molecules and quantify them. And it was really exciting to see that many of these metabolites, uh, just like genes, kind of went up and down in terms of their, their concentration in cells as a function of these, uh, we call them metabolic cycles. And so then the hypothesis was that maybe some of these oscillations in metabolites would be linked to oscillations in, in certain gene modules or groups of genes, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I think it was, you know, one of the first metabolites I added to the, to the mass spec method was, was acetyl-CoA. Just, you know, I just re recalled it from my biochemistry classes and you know, we ordered a, a standard from Sigma, uh, you know, developed the method and, you know, we sampled, uh, you know, quite consistently over, over two cycles and found that, for example, levels of acetyl-CoA were extremely periodic. It was uh, just a beautiful data that we could get because the cells are so synchronized. And so this just made us wonder, you know, are oscillations in acetyl-CoA somehow tied to oscillations in gene expression? And then that led us to to look at histones and we found that you know remarkably you know histone acetylation was extremely dynamic and then yeah. uh yeah yeah and in a specific group of genes these genes that are expressed during this high oxygen consumption phase they all acquired acetylated histones in tune with these oscillations in acetylcholine so that was a very uh, exciting finding for us yeah i, I find that uh really interesting and so it, so it suggests that like uh, cycles of metabolites govern acetylation of these specific genes. So I wonder how, how do you think that it's the modification on the chromatin is being targeted to the genes that are oscillatory? Do you think is, is it, does that question make sense? <laughs> does, is, it, are, is there a targeting or is it, do you think it's just kind of general acetylation changes over the course of a day? Yeah, yeah. So uh, no, it's, it's definitely a, uh, 
a, a good question. And you know, how's how is the specificity achieved? Like, for example, you know, we observed over a thousand genes involved in various uh, growth or growth related processes kind of peaking during this high oxygen consumption phase. And by doing a chip seek analysis, we could observe that pretty much each and every one of those genes, if you look at the genomic locus, acquired histone acetylation. So how in the world uh, does a cell do this? And, you know, uh, there isn't really one transcription factor. You might think there could be a master transcription factor that finds each of those genes. But instead, what we found was there was a, a transcriptional co-activator uh, called Saga. And we could uh, observe Saga at many, many of these genes. And so I think sort of the specificity can come from a transcriptional co-activator that can then presumably pair with uh, a set of transcription factors to then find you know, each and every one of those 1,000 plus genes to turn them on. And also, you know, uh, in addition to histone acetylation, for example, uh, we know that non-histone proteins can also be acetylated. And so we uh, observed that uh, several subunits within this coactivator saga could also be acetylated. So we hypothesized that uh, perhaps you know, acetylation or other post-translational modifications of this coactivator could help in targeting and achieving specificity. Wow, that's yeah, that's really interesting. So it's not only modifying the histone, but it's, it's modifying like other functions in the cell, basically. It's, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, one question that came up for me is, is, is this kind of uh, cycle, I mean, metabolite cycle regulating epigenetic changes, is that, is that unique to acetyl-CoA or is there other, other metabolites, other changes that um, exert similar influences or that, that you know of or that you've seen? Or... Yeah, it's another very good question. So in the case of um, these uh, yeast oscillations, so uh, it's easiest to observe these yeast oscillations under conditions of glucose limitation. And so, you know, glucose is a carbon source. And I think this led us to this finding of acyl-CoA, which is, I, you could argue, is an indicator of sort of a carbon source availability, if you will. But then, uh, as you correctly uh, uh, described, uh, there are other uh, epigenetic modifications, such as methylation. And so, you know, my lab has recently become quite interested in links between methylation and the methyl donor, which is s methionine. And so SAM is, is another very interesting metabolite. Uh, instead of you know, a two carbon currency, it's a, it's a one carbon currency of the cell. And levels of SAM are tied to levels of uh, amino acid called methionine. And so uh, using a different experimental regimen now, we've been studying links between uh, SAM and various methylation modifications in the cell. And it's just harder to see it in the yeast oscillatory system because those are conditions of carbon limitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think instead what we need are conditions of perhaps sulfur limitation because um, SAM is a sulfur containing uh, metabolite that also doubles as a methyl donor. Yeah, but I, I, I do believe that there are very interesting connections between methylation and SAM akin to uh, uh, acetylation and acetyl-CoA. It's yeah. just that the, the yeast conditions we used to observe the oscillations uh, were very easily, uh, we could see them because it's a glucose limitation condition. And thus the acetyl-CoA is quite limiting under these conditions required for oscillation. So I have kind of two questions that are emerging from this. So, so the first is, um, do, you, do you have, is there, I mean, I don't know how exactly you would uh, study this, but is there evidence that like these oscillations occur in kind of wild <laughs> yeast or like, like, I don't know how, how there's a way of defining this, but uh, I'd be interested to hear about that. And also, if, if you could extrapolate, do um, you think similar kind of metabolic oscillations underlie other rhythms in other organisms um, or relate to circadian rhythms and things like that? So it's kind of two, two questions that are <laughs> diverging, but. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we definitely use more wild uh, strains uh, to see these oscillations. So our, the strains we use are prototrophic, meaning they basically have no metabolic or nutritional deficiencies. And that's sort of what you would expect to find for a, a, a yeast cell in the wild, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder, at least for us, to see these oscillations with the common laboratory strains of yeast. Um, uh, 
those who work with yeast will know that oftentimes we use sort of nutritional selection. So these uh, common lab strains, for example, can't make their own leucine, uracil, methionine, uh, tryptophan, et cetera. And so then, you know, these lab strains sort of have these metabolic uh, dependencies, right? So you, you can't really get them to grow unless you supplement them with like leucine or methionine or uracil. And so it turns out that these yeast cells can kind of get confused uh, when you grow them uh, because if you're supplementing these nutrients, they can also then uh, catabolize them and use them to make other things. So then they're, you know, okay. they're basically, uh, they're kind of metabolically confused because they don't know sort of what they're missing and what, what they should do. And, and they'll basically catabolize things that you give to them in the way that maybe you don't want them to, right? So I would say that for many of the oscillations reported in yeast uh, over the years, and including the how we observe them, they've been used, uh, uh, they, they use these prototrophic strains that don't have these metabolic uh, deficiencies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, at least I'd, I'd like to think that uh, some of the sort of underlying principles of uh, these metabolic oscillations would be seen as a function of circadian or the sleep wake cycles. And indeed, uh, various labs, circadian labs, have observed uh, quite uh, dramatic oscillations in, in other uh, epigenetic modifications, uh, some including acetylation, or you can imagine as a function of uh, feeding or fasting. Uh, so we'd like to think that some of these principles we uncover with the yeast system could apply to uh, you know, uh, other biological uh, oscillatory systems. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really interesting idea uh, how substrate availability affects epigenetic changes and oscillates. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just was wondering, um, kind of, as our last question, kind of what what's next for you along these this line of research, or what are kind of big open questions that you see in the field, or um, if you'd like to speculate about kind of future directions um, and things like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. I think this yeast system is, is really powerful, you know, due to the amazing synchrony of the cells. So you can kind of really see cool uh, regulatory mechanisms linked to metabolism. You can see them much more easily when the cells are totally in sync. And it's a, you can imagine it's a very well-controlled system because, you know, oftentimes you're just sampling from the same vessel just at different times, right? So it's an incredibly controlled system and it's been very powerful to understand how gene expression, uh, not just gene activation, but also uh, post-transcriptional regulation, for example, uh, is linked to changes in, in metabolic state. And we think some of these principles are very fundamental, will be conserved in higher eukaryotes. And for example, our uh, interests in discoveries and on links between gene regulation and ASCO-CoA has inspired some strategies for potentially uh, inhibiting uh, tumor genesis. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this made us think about how cancer cells get ASCO-CoA, for example. And, uh, you know, also I think for example, in terms of the uh, folks interested in aging and lifespan and cell survival, uh, because we can see the whole cohort of genes involved in stress response, stress defense coming on at a different time. And there's been a ton of interest in sort of, uh, you know, what's the master transcription factor that could turn on these genes that might be important for increased longevity or lifespan. And so we're now very interested in identifying those mechanisms, which could then potentially inspire some cool therapeutic strategies uh, that uh, yeah, do. so I said that was the last question, but since you said that, I, so, I mean, yeast are used as a, often as a model of cellular aging, and I, and I wonder, do you see, and age, aging is also associated with circadian disruption sometimes, so I wonder, do you see, do, do the oscillations change in it as your yeast system ages, like, do you, do you see that this system becomes disrupted during aging in your yeast, or have you not kind of looked at that, or, or is that a, a dumb question? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, no, that that is an interesting question. Um, so, you know, one way to sort of, um, uh, I guess, yeast cells undergo replicative aging. And so that's basically the number of times a mother produces a daughter. And you can kind of uh, 
you can kind of determine that by looking at the pattern of bud scars. And so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, not every uh, cell divides during each of these oscillations. And so one question that was always on the back of our minds was that, you know, who gets to divide? You know, are they the older mothers or are they the younger mothers? Uh, and so we, we just haven't done the experiment, but there could be some sort of uh, uh, preference for who gets to divide. And, uh, you know, we just haven't looked in terms of the replicative lifespan of dividing cells. And, you know, we haven't really done so many long-term experiments where you can imagine you've got the same cells uh, kind of persisting for a very, very long time. And you can imagine doing some interesting aging experiments uh, if you could sort of now enrich for uh, old, older cells in the population, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, nice. It was really uh, nice to chat with you. So thank you for joining us today and telling us about your work. And I, I think we'll call it there. Okay. Unless, do you have you. anything else to plug or anything else? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah, no, I thanks. So, yeah, no, it, I think this was re really nice.